Hi, this is Sherry Thomas, and this is How I Create. Welcome to This Is How We Create, a show that digs deeper into the creative life of contemporary artists of color. Discover what feeds their creativity and how they've found or are finding their artistic voice. Through these intimate and candid conversations, you'll gain insights into the lives of creative professionals of color that are hard to find anywhere else. Welcome back to This Is How We Create. My name is Martine Severin, your host, and I am so pleased to have one of my favorite writers, Sherry Thomas, on the podcast. Sherry, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's a delight to be here. Well, I'm glad to have you, Sherry. When my sister and I found out that, well, when I told her that you confirmed that you were going to be on the podcast, we did a little jig because she introduced your work to me. And so I'm forever grateful. And I think that you are definitely one of the writers that I reread the most, at least I I, I reread you the most. We'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much. (laughs) So, Kim, I'd love for us to start out by having you tell us a little bit about you and about your creative life and your creative career. Well, I was born in China to a nice family of scientists and engineers. But my grandmother was a English professor. She was an English instructor at our local college, and she loved to read. So the love of reading was passed down from her to me. It skipped my mother altogether. <laughs> the love of reading fiction, at least. And ever since I was little, I don't, I don't, I don't even think I remember learning to read. I just remember not being able to read and holding a book with some puzzlement. And then the next thing I knew, I was going through entire books by myself. It was just always my favorite thing. As I get older and older, sometimes I would say the love of my life is story because. <laughs> That's a thing I absolutely must have every day of my life. I didn't really think I was going to be an author, at least not seriously. When I was in fifth grade, you know, when people were throwing out, I want to be this, I want to be that, I did briefly say, you know, maybe I'll be a writer of children's literature. But then I tried my hand at it. And two pages in, I was like, well, what happens next? And I didn't know. I absolutely did not know. And I would just stare at these like cute little openings and be dumbfounded as to what would happen next. So that was it. That was like the end of my creative aspirations. And my mother was a student in the US and around the time she was studying, my grandmother passed away. So she was an only child and I am her only child. So she decided to bring my grandfather, her father and me to the US so she could look after us because grandpa was old and he was like a more old fashioned gentleman. He was really good at like washing dishes and stuff like that, but he didn't know how to cook. He didn't know, you know, a lot of the other household stuff. So, so we came to the US to live with her and the original plan was you know, would would be here just for a couple of years. But then later she got a job here. So I, you know, having no choice in the matter, I had to stay with her. And so that's why I stayed here and I went to college and I took a very practical, well, it would have been very, very practical if I had done my biochemistry uh, degree as originally intended, but I really didn't much care for biochemistry. So I took an equally practical business degree and then promptly got pregnant as I was graduating college. So instead of going on to grad school to study international trade and finance, I became a stay-at-home mom at the age of 21. And that was, let's say, coming to the U.S. was the first great turning point of my life. Becoming a stay-at-home mother, like getting married at age 21 and becoming a mother was the second great turning point of my life. And the third great point, turning point in my life, even though I did not realize it, I mean, those first two were kind of obvious, right? You knew your life was going to change when those, the third one was the strangest one yet. And I only realized its significance in hindsight, which was when my son was one half years old. One day I took him to the library and there I got a historical romance by an author I used to enjoy a lot when I was a teenager. This is where I should say I learned English, reading a ton of romance and a ton of science fiction when I was a teenager. I took the baby and the book home and put the baby down for a nap and started reading. I am a notorious non-finisher of books. Like if I don't like a book, I just put it down. No biggie. But that day, because I was, I was just such a, you know, disorganized, 
young mother, like I was always on my hind foot, like everything was just like catching me by surprise. So that one hour of nap time was just infinitely precious to me. And I read that book and that book did not give me any pleasure during that one hour. Oh. And instead of just putting it aside, well, in addition to just putting it aside, I also got mad. <laughs> I was mad that, you know, my little bit, tiny bit of, pre you know, precious free time was wasted on this book. And I'm not sure what happened between the time I set the book down and the time my husband came back home that evening. But when he came back home that evening, I told him, hey, I read a book that I didn't think was any good, but this lady is on the New York Times bestseller list. So maybe I could also, you know, since I'm staying home anyway, maybe I could also write some books and maybe make a little money. And mind you, you know, I study business. Uh, and until this point, I had never told my husband I had any plans to write, nor did I have like these boxes <laughs> of notebooks to show him that, hey, I had, you know, talent, I had aspiration, I had nothing. I was just like, suddenly came up with this proposition for him. And to his eternal credit, he did not say at that time, nor at any point since, have you lost your mind? He just kind of like, okay, if it makes you happy, go ahead. And yeah, as I said, the, the older I get, the more I amazed I am. Actually, not that I made that decision, but subsequently I stuck with it. So when you look back, it's got like the fingers of karma. It's got like fingers of predestination all over it in some ways, because, because I try things and I give them up very easily. But this one, I just stuck with it. After I told my husband I wanted to write a historical romance, I started researching and I started writing. And about a year and a half later, I had my first manuscript ready. Nobody wanted it, but that agent did tell me she thought I had promise. So when I wrote another manuscript, I queried her and she represented me. That manuscript did not sell. She did take it out, you know, on submission, but it did not sell. And then I wrote a few more books. My agent dropped me. I got another agent. I got ready to go back to grad school because my kids were now getting older. The younger one, like the older, the, the one I started one half was now in elementary school. And even the younger one was, you know, about to go to kindergarten. So I thought, okay, I need to start contributing to the family coffer. So I got ready to go back to grad school. At this point, I discovered my first manuscript and I thought, wow, this sucks. But, but, but I thought <laughs> while the execution sucked, I could still see something interesting about the idea of the book. So I kind of just tore the whole thing down and rebuilt it from scratch. And this around the same time as I was applying to go to grad school. And I got into grad school and they offered me a fellowship. And I was all thrilled. This would be like the first, you know, serious bit of money I make in 10 years. But basically a week after class started in my grad school, I sold my first First, my, I sold my books. My agent was like, the call came in the middle of the class. I left my class. I took the call. I came back. I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> Looking back, I should have quit school to write, but I could not give up that fellowship because, as I said, I hadn't earned any money in 10 years. And I was like, yes, I'm going to. Yeah, it was the worst year and a half in my life as I wrote my sophomore novel, which people typically have trouble with anyway, and got my degree, my graduate degree in accounting. But that was how I sort of got started. This is a long story, but <laughs> it's, but it, I think the thing is that we always assume that whoever it is that we admire, we assume that their journey just went like this. And really it's like, like this plateau, like this plateau, and then jig, 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 you fall down. And oh, then, yes. You, sometimes you, know, you it's, fall it, right back that's down. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Right. So, so it was five manuscripts and eight years before I got my first New York contract. And at that time, self-publishing wasn't a thing yet because it was in the Jurassic age. And so that was the only viable path. And looking back, I'm, I'm grateful for the apprenticeship. It kind of, that was when I realized I wanted to do this. When I kept doing it and didn't stop rejection after rejection, that was when I realized, so this is actually what I want to do. Wow. So what did those five manuscripts teach you? What did you learn while you were going through and just cutting your teeth? Apparently not enough, because I will tell you this. When I revised my first manuscript, when I thought it and thought it sucked and but thought, okay, I know how to fix this. But when I 
revised it, I thought to myself, now I have learned everything I need to know about writing romances. Like I seriously thought that. And then I would have such huge troubles in the process of writing my next three books. They were all under contract. They all had a deadline. They all had a, they all had an editor on the other end. And my editor rejected each and every one of those books in their, you know, initial incarnation, like rejected hard. My first, the first manuscript I turned in, my sophomore no novel was met with a 16 page single space editorial letter. I threw out that whole manuscript. And the second one, I mean, the, the next one, so my third book, I was told that if you cannot fix this in three weeks, we're going to have to like push your publication date out another year. I was like, I never written so fast in my life. In three weeks, I rewrote like 60% of the book. Granted, it's not a long book, but still 60% of the book. And the fourth one, my God, the fourth one, my critique partner had to stay up overnight with me just because it just felt like such a desperate struggle at the end. I would write and she would, you know, say, good, not good. This is what you need to change. At one point, she said, go to bed because you're writing rubbish, you're writing nonsense. Um, well, let's go back a little bit, Sherry, because I, I want to talk through the process in terms of how you're creating your transcripts. So for those of us who may not know, like me, in terms of what the process is, so you have an idea and what happens to, so you have the idea and you might start writing a proposal per se, and then you submit it to, and you submit it to see if it has, if it's, if they're interested in it, how does that whole process work? Okay. Very often that is how it works, but it has never worked in my it's very rarely worked in my case in the sense that if I cannot get people to buy me on an idea, like if I say, for example, for Lady Sherlock, I just said, I want to write a female Sherlock Holmes series. And maybe the first one will be about, you know, how she you know, became Lady Sherlock. Second one will be about somebody else. If I cannot get people to like buy me on a couple of paragraphs, nobody has ever bought me on a partial because my books don't look very good as partials. <laughs> it's just like, because I think I am one of those people who have to write a book to know what a book will actually look like. And I very often will fix the beginning after I've written the end, because only after you write the end, you kind of know what your whole book is about. And then I like to write books where in the beginning, I tell people what this book is about. So my creative process is lots of iterations. Like there are other people who work differently. They can outline. And I know I have a friend who says, as soon as she gets the first three chapters right, then the rest of the book just like comes out whoosh. But mine will be just like, I typically will write 10,000 words and then have to go back and see what's not working. And then maybe I write 30,000 words and see what's not working. If I hit the 50,000 word point, usually I know I can finish this book. No matter what else might be wrong with it at the moment, I can fix it. But what my three books with my first editor taught me was that at the time she kept telling me a book need a spine. And I would think a lot about it in retrospect because she didn't use those terms and I didn't understand it in those terms. But what she taught me was story structure. She taught me a story needed structure, which was why I had such trouble because I would write merrily along and my story was kind of fall off a, a cliff and I didn't quite know it. I would just like keep writing, keep writing, keep writing. As long as something seems to be on the page, I would go like, wow, look at that. I've made another book. No. Yeah. You have a pile of words. That's not the same thing as a story. So yeah, my, I am a iterative writer. So tell us about what makes a story then. What makes a story? is very often it is said that stories are characters in conflict. But I think that's only a part of it. Story is characters in conflict. Once the plot has come through and totally disrupted the norm. Because in the beginning, even if characters are already in conflict, they could be in a holding pattern like North and South Korea. They've been in conflict for like the better part of a century, but they still haven't erupted in, into open war. A story is about what happens 
that come along and take the situation and take this character and throw them into open war, or in the case of a romance, you know, take these two characters who would rather not be with each other for various reasons, whether they are, you know, whether they are adversaries at work, whether one of them is in love with the other, whether oh, in love with someone else, or whether one of them is actually in love with the other person, but the other person is unaware of it or can re respond for whatever reason. The story only happens after you throw these people in a cage. Your plot is to come along and lock these people in a cage in the case of a romance. And say, for example, in the case of a mystery, you have to have the body. You have to have the body mm. to kick things out. But that's not where it ends. So that was where my mistake was. I thought once I had this, you know, set up, I'm done. No, what you need is you still need at several different points in the story, depending on what you're genre you're writing. So for romance, you need a several different points in the story for the nature of the relationship to completely change, like change in an irreversible way. They cannot go back mm -hmm. to what they were before. And same with, with a mystery. You need for the whoever is investigating the case, you need them to find something that changed their entire understanding of who this person was and why this person died and why people are trying to hide it, you know, all those things. So you can't just change things at the beginning. You have to keep changing things during the book and then you bring it to a satisfactory ending. Oh gosh. And you do it so well, Sherry. I think your story is always bring me. Only because I did it so me. badly. Only because I did it so <laughs> badly for so long. And it was like the lesson was like beaten into me. Like I oh, used to you say- You learned your lesson. <laughs> I learned my lesson. I hope so. I used to I used to joke that, you know, whenever a manuscript of mine goes in is when my editor gets drunk and, you know, and shags her gay best friend. And, uh, and then the, another thing I've learned is that you only know how to write the book you're with. You only, you can, you only, you never learn to write all books. You only learn how to write this book. The next book is somehow, you know, a different can of worms requiring. And you've written so many, you've written so many different things. You've written young adult novels, such as the Burning Sky series that's behind you, that poster that's behind you. You've written historical mysteries which we're going to talk about next you've written a few contemporary pieces as well as historical romance novels and then there was the magnolia sword which was the tale of mulan which mm -hmm. i'm in the process of reading now which is so fantastic oh there's thank so you. much as you were talking about conflict there's conflict at every turn, you know, the conflict between Mulan and her father, the conflict between her and the hero, and then China's at war. I mean, there's so much that goes on. And I swear, my favorite thing to do is to like pick up a Sherry Thomas novel and just sit and with a cup of tea and just chill out. It's kind of like it's it's either Sherry Thomas or it is watching Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> Thank you. Pride and I love Pride and Prejudice. So I've, I've seen every Pride and Prejudice variation there is. So that is the greatest me compliment too. you can pay me. In fact, one yeah. of the things I keep thinking was like how to write my own Pride and Prejudice adaptation, but I still haven't come up with an interesting angle yet. I'm um, sure it will come to you. I Go hope ahead. so. I sent you a list, a laundry list of questions that I wanted to ask. I guess one of the questions that I do have is in doing research for this interview one of the things i found was that you you said that you write about two books per year I said i never write more than two books a year well you never write more than two books <laughs> no. a year and that doesn't and, seem impressive <laughs> no what i meant was i i i'm not even sure i've ever written two books yet i have written like mm -hmm. three books in two years when push came to shove but you know one book a year is more like what I more often do than two books a year. Okay. So well, I at this point, I'd love, <laughs> well, I, at this point, I'd love to talk about A Ruse of Shadows, which is the latest Lady Sherlock historical mysteries. And as I was saying to you above at the, at the top of the podcast was how I was reading your latest Lady Sherlock novel and I, just was I gasped I was in the middle of taking a ferry and then the 
the person who the killer was revealed and I did not see it coming. And then as soon as I finished the novel, I said to my husband, I can't believe she did it to me. I can't believe it. I didn't see it coming. And so I went and I ordered the actual book because I was listening to the audio. And so I got the book because I was just like, she fooled me. That Sherry Thomas, she got me. So for this, we know that A Ruse of Shadows comes out on June 25th. I would love to start talking about the Lady Sherlock mysteries by asking you, when did you first get the idea for the series? Or did you just get the idea for one and then it eventually became a series? What, what happened was I read Sherlock Holmes as a kid in Chinese. In fact, I remember my grandfather got those books. Uh, he borrowed it from the library at his university uh, because he was a professor there. And, and I love them. But at the same time, around the time I was reading the original, I read the 7% solution, which is a, which is a famous book in the Sherlock Holmes pastiche. Pastiche meaning like Sherlock Holmes books written by someone other than Arthur Conan Doyle. So I read that around the same time and I thought, oh, this is really cool. I know it wasn't written by the original author, but it really plugs in a lot of the holes about, you know, because in the original book, you can, you know, he was using drugs and all that. And 7% solution is him having to go to rehab because he was using drugs. And I was like, this is so interesting. And it was like an interesting adventure of its own. So I've always been very interested in, in, in fact, more than the original books, I'm more interested in what other people do with the concept of Sherlock Holmes. And so the first time I ever thought to myself, I want to try this myself was when I read Laurie King's Mary Russell and Sherlock Holmes book, in which she gave Sherlock Holmes a extreme, a basically a companion and later wife with exactly the same brain as he does, he has. And I was like, wow, this is so interesting. Like basically they put smush two Sherlock Holmes together. But at the time I just started my historical romance career. And also given what I just told you about my inability to hold to a story structure, I was like, well, plotting is a weak point for me. Maybe I should leave mysteries alone. Fast forward a few years, a bunch of years, BBC Sherlock had come out and that first season of BBC Sherlock was so terrific. And I just loved it so much. It was so stylish. The mysteries were good. And the characterization, I mean, even though Sherlock Holmes, they made Sherlock Holmes, even though Cumberbatch Sherlock Holmes was an asshole, he was, an, he was a fun asshole at that point. Very stylish, lots of charisma. And so I was like, wow. Once again, I thought, I would like to do this. I would like to write an adaptation that's got that flair, that's got that fun factor, that's got that, you know. and the difference was at that point, I had written the Burning Sky series. And the second book in the series, without me quite intending it, was a mystery. Once I finished writing that middle book in the trilogy, I was like, this is a mystery. This is about, because the overweening question in this book is about what happened. And the book was told in a way that at the end of the book, you find out what happened. So at that point, I had a little confidence. And so I thought, Okay, if I am to actually do this, what do I want to do? BBC Sherlock already moved to contemporary times and over elementary, was it CBS's elementary? They already made Watson a woman. And so I thought, well, the only thing that's left to do is to make Sherlock Holmes, the original, make Sherlock a woman. And I Googled to see if people were doing it. And apparently, other than maybe some fan fiction, there was no published book to that effect. So I thought... Well, I better get, <laughs> get with it then. And as this so happened, at the time, I'd written nine historical romances, and I was running out of ideas for what else to do for next historical romance. So I just gave this proposal, said, instead of historical romance for our next contract, I would like to write historical mysteries. And I got lucky in the sense that it was... Gosh, was, was it 2014 or something like that? And publishing houses were bleeding writers because people were making a ton of money in self-publishing. And so they were losing a lot of authors. They were especially losing romance authors. So here I was, I was willing to continue to write for my publisher. And so I'm guessing they probably said, okay, we'll just throw her a bone and keep her, you know, so that we don't run out of all authors. So they just said, sure, here's a three book contract. And I was like, I had expected a little more struggle, but here we were. And at that time, it was pitched as a series. And I did intend it as a series, but 
I must say, to this day, I still cannot plot ahead, in the sense that I have no idea what would happen in the future. Like, or at least I only have the vaguest idea. So I can only deal with one book at a time. I don't think the first three books, in the end, looked a whole lot like what I proposed. But but the first book we always knew was going to be the origin story. And then when I came to writing the second book. It was a case of I absolutely didn't know what to do for this book, but I knew that I knew what I want to do for the fifth book, which involved because there's a romance in these books, and I was like, I'm a romance writer. Why not write a slow burning romance? I knew what I wanted to happen in book five of this 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 romance plot. I didn't know what to do, so I stole the plot from book five. And a lot of people was like, "Wow, this is the slowest of slow burn romances." And I would think in the back of my head, "You had no idea how much slower it was going to be. If if only I had known what to do for book two, this book, you know, this romance would have gone so much more slower." But because I didn't know what to do, I stole the plot from book five. Then I gave a new plot to book five, and when book three came. I still didn't know what to do, so I again stole the plot from book five. So, like the romance actually went much faster than I thought it would, because other than things having to do with the romance, I didn't know what to write. It was like, okay, have this character do this, have that character do that. But and to be a little more specific, Lady Sherlock has a love interest, but at the in book one he's married, and、uh, I was going to leave his marriage for long for a while, but I didn't know what to do. So in book two, his wife. Came to Lady Sherlock to ask for help finding her old lover, and in book three, the wife was murdered. So, like all of a sudden, the romance plot moved much faster than it was going to. And then subsequently, what I ever did was I because I can't plot ahead, but I can look back to what I already did. So I would like pull out elements. Okay, so this happened, that element happened. Let me develop that a little further. So that was how like sometimes books keep going because I would look back and say, okay, I can do some this with these characters given I've already done that. Slowly, slowly, the book has it. It ended up being very tightly knit series. Like it's a big overarching story, but that's not because I plotted ahead because I reverse engineered it. Well, I love the characters. They are so they're delightful. Their stories, though, their origin stories are so it's so tough. What Charlotte had to go through before becoming now the lead inspector. You know, everyone comes to her now, and even and, Mrs. And she's Watts. A, and she's a very lucky woman. She didn't really have、she's, to go through as much as some of the other women in the other, series have had to go through. Yeah. That's true. But, She's but very still, lucky. But still, it's true. She she has had to go through quite a bit and take her lumps.、So. She sure did. And you know, obviously, then there are her chins, which I love. How you talk about how she loves to eat and she measures how she likes to eat. And when she's eaten too much, by how many chins she's developed. She's an absolutely beautiful character, and all of the characters are are great. Can you talk to us a little bit about this book? Because in this book, I don't think I'm giving anything away. Because I mean, it hasn't come out yet. It'll come out in June 25th. But Charlotte gets into a bit of hot water in this book. It tells you in chapter one, she is being suspected of a murder because she was the person who like. Was seen frequently visiting this person who, you know, has been found dead, and and the, she was the only person seen to be visiting this person because this person is some sort of a prisoner. And I always wanted to do so, like I don't like too much of putting my detective in danger because I feel like if she's in danger every book, then she's like. You know, then I would feel like her life is hanging by a thread. I would feel like I would feel a little worried about her, and I don't want to worry. I want to worry a little bit to make me keep reading, but I don't want to be like so tense that I'd be like, no, I need to put this down to like you know to breathe. So I always want to do a little bit of the Charlotte in danger thing. So this this time I got to do it that she is actually being suspected for the murder, but this whole book is actually. A large ruse, and this is also not a. I'm also not hiding this from the from the readers because it said pretty much says in chapter two that there's a lot of going on. That is a ruse. They're pretending things. the The trick is to how to weave everything together and not to forget the ultimate objective of this book, which is you know basically to she and Moriarty are locked in a struggle. 
So this is to advance her side of the cause, to like even level the playing field a little bit against Moriarty. My editor says this is her favorite book of the series. Since she's read all eight of the books, I thought that was a really good verdict, and I did. I did like how it turned out in the end. And there was one particular chapter、uh, toward the back of the book where, as I was writing it, I was like basically laughing my head off because it just felt so funny. Everything that was、uh, happening, the whole plot was like paying off. So I hope people will read this book, but I also hope if they haven't read the previous books, it will be fun to start from the beginning because it's one large overarching story. And when you get to that point, you'll be like itching for something to happen to, like you know, knock Moriarty down a peg. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait. And and so also just, and then... also in in this in this book, of course, everybody's romances develop a little more. So. <laughs> For people yeah, who are reading it, the relationship. Kind of, yes, there are a lot of different relationships that are happening here, and so I'm excited to see because we see the characters grow from book to book to book. Not only Charlotte, but her sister, Mrs. Watts, the love interest, and even there's so much growth, and、uh, I'm excited for this one. I have a question for you、mm -hmm. about. You mentioned your. Critique partner as well as your editors. When you receive notes, how do you approach the edits, and how do you decide what to incorporate when you are making changes on your end? So after I finish pulling my hair out, because how dare they think this manuscript is not perfect? Even though I know that's why I need them in the first place. Then I get to work. I will read through what they want done. I will read through what they want done, and then I will kind of come to various. So there will be changes, and will be the vast majority of changes. What they want will be like okay, I can see it. Whether it's you know it's a line edit, whether it's they say the, this character need to be developed more fully or explored, explored their emotions need to be explored more. Whether this this. Seeing it needs more tension, stuff like that. Usually, when I see the suggestions, I would agree with it right away because these people are good at what they do. My editor is good at being an editor. My critique partner is extraordinary at being a critique partner. So most of the time, when I see what they suggest, I agree with it, and I just, you know, make changes. There will be times when I see a suggestion, and I will immediately know, like, no, I am not doing anything with that. I would feel that okay, maybe they didn't get it. Maybe this is just not up their alley. Maybe you know it's just, or maybe it's not something that, in my view, would make a large enough impact to worth the work. So, a large majority, yes. Small min, small minority, no. And then there will be in the middle various things. Will be like, do I want to do it, or like, or do I know how to do it? So some of those I might just let it sit for a bit. So this is why I read the suggestions up front. So as I make my changes, my subconscious will have time to work on the stuff I'm certain about. So in the end, I will know. Okay, I will do it, or no, I won't do it, or I want to do it, but how do I do it? And I think a lot of times people don't like revisions because I mean it is a dent on your ego. It is people saying your work needs this much more work, even though you have like slaved a lot over it already. But I feel like the best way to think about it is, especially if you agree with the edits, it's like. It's it's not them making it better in the end. It's you making the story better. My 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 edit my agent my I mean my critique partner or my editor might have an idea of how they want a book to read, but in the end, it's my word. It's my idea. It's how I fix it. So in the end, the story is still wholly mine. Just that. So I would think that that okay, I already liked it, but after I make these changes, then people who have taste like my critique partners and my taste like my editors, who which may be similar but still different from mine, that they would also like it. So I'm thinking, you know, by doing this work, I am opening this thing up to a greater number of people who might enjoy it than if I didn't do this work.、Um, so I feel it's quite worthwhile, and as such, we are. I never think of myself as artist and so much as a craftsperson. As a craftsperson, there's no shame in like there's no eternal art. Like I see, I see a book like, kind of like a lot of clay. 
you know, you can just smoosh it down to a clump and restart again. There's, there's nothing lost there. That's beautiful. I love that. Sherry, you mentioned your critique partner. Is it, is this a normal thing with writing that most writers have a critique partner? I feel like most of the writers I know, they have some sort of feedback system. I, I'm, I'm not sure whether if people are writing super fast for self-publishing, if they're writing 12 books a year, whether they have time for that. But I think for most writers I know who work in traditional publishing, they, they do. They have people who will critique them in a substantive manner on the manuscript, like not just, not just whether this prose reads right, but whether, whether your, your story structure you know, is hanging okay, whether, whether, you know, your pacing is off or your pacing is good and whether your characters are making like terrible decisions that they should not be making terrible decisions, not, not just in the sense of the book, but whether in, in the sense of how would it read to the audience, whether they're going to just like absolutely hate your characters if they do these things. So most people have a feedback system. Some may not be critique partners. Some authors may send them out to beta readers, but I have a critique partner in, which means like she will read my manuscript. And when she has a manuscript, I will read hers and offer a similar kind of critique in return. So then what makes a good critique partner? For, for different people, that would mean different things. I think for me, my critic partner works well for me because I have managed to become my own substantive editor in the sense that at this point, I can more or less gauge that a book has got the right pacing and has got the right structure. But my brain is such that I can only do one thing at a time. So when I am busy trying to figure out you know, in the sense that, okay, if I'm busy trying to get the foundation of this house right and make sure the walls are hanging straight and everything, you know, the pipes, pipelines are connected in the right place <laughs> underneath, then I may not have decorated the house properly. The carpet may be the wrong color and the paint may be the wrong texture. So my critique partner's specialty is, you know, she's great at characterization and she's great at pointing out inefficiency in prose. And she's great at pointing out where I may not be, my characters may not be, you know, feeling enough emotions to come across to readers. So that's perfect because I get the structure right and she makes sure I get the details and the the textural feel of the book, right? And then I'm assuming vice versa, right? So you help her with the the scaffolding of her story. Exactly. When it, My when, okay. Exactly. When I read hers, and that's where she also she needs more help is with the bigger scaffolding because she can take care of the details herself. Gosh. Sherry, this has been so much fun. The last question I have for you is what are you working on next? Is there anything that you can share with us? I am about to finish a contemporary mystery. Actually, I can't tell you the details yet, but this was something my publisher wanted me to write. And at various points, I was like, should I be giving back this advance? Because what the heck am I doing writing a contemporary mystery? But now that I'm almost finished, it, I have become quite fond of it. And after this, I will go into book nine of the Lady Sherlock series. And once that is done, I have, I mean, it depends on what book nine is. So after book nine, I will know if I still have more stories left in the Lady Sherlock series that I want to tell, or if I want to go on doing some other things. But either way, I still feel pretty okay. I feel like I remember early on in my career, I told my critique partner, hey, if I jump the shark, let me know. <laughs> I feel like everybody needs to have somebody who tell them, yeah, you, you know, you're over the hill. But so far, I feel like creatively speaking, my brain still seems to be okay. Like I've taken to thanking my brain in every acknowledgement just because I feel like, like I'm just so grateful it has held up. It hasn't given up on me or anything. So yeah, what's coming up next? It will be like different, various interesting things. On June 25th, we have A Ruse of Shadows, which is book eight in the Lady Sherlock historical mysteries that's coming out. Everyone should totally check it out. And if you haven't started, you know, obviously start from the beginning, you will have such a good time. I just, I'm a big fan, Sherry, so I think everybody should read you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so kind of you. 